success. Let's go to the Bible, if you could, to Acts 17. And I am just excited about what's going on and what God is doing. And I say this with just about every church plant, uh, but by the time we get to this point in, in me visiting and so on, uh, we are no longer trying to figure out if God is in this. We are here because God is in this. And that makes a huge difference, doesn't it? Acts chapter 17, if you would get there with me. Um, we uh, obviously are not going to go to Dayton to find out if God will do something. Uh, I believe with all my heart that your pastor already probably knows this, and Brother Pete already knows this, and, and hopefully the church knows this, uh, but the efforts of planting a church in Dayton are not just to see if God will do something, uh, but the efforts are going that direction because God is doing something. And if God be for us, who can be against us? And like I said this morning, where there is God's will, there is a way. And so it is a joy, it's a thrill to be a part of what God is doing. And we're not just testing the waters here, we're following the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God. And so it's, it's a tremendous undertaking. And by the way, uh, preparation is big. Uh, you know, think about it this way. Um, God is sovereign, is He not? God is overall. God has a plan for every one of us. God knew us before we were born. Uh, God had a design for each and every one of us and our families and this church and all of that. There is a very sovereign God that we serve. And if God wants a church to start in Dayton, then a church will start in Dayton, right? Now watch this. We have a sovereign God. We have a God that's absolutely involved with everything. But on the other side of that, there's also our responsibility. In other words, you could stay here in your church and say, you know what, God's moved in our heart to help start a church in Dayton, so let's pray that God does that. But you know what, you could also stay home tonight and say, boy, it'd be great to be a part of that service. Boy, I wish I could be a part of that service. And God, if you want me to be a part of that service, then move me, put me in my car and drive me to that church and put me in that pew. So this whole idea of seeing churches and taking uh, started and taking Christ to communities, there is God's sovereignty and God's movement and so on, but there's also our responsibility. Amen. Salvation is that way, is it not? God is sovereign. He wants everyone to be saved. But then there's our personal responsibility, our free will that he has given to us to act on that sovereignty and grace and to accept the Lord Jesus as our personal Savior. And so tonight what we're trying to do is we're trying to take God's sovereignty and God's moving of, of Brother Pete to go to Dayton and, and this church and your pastor and, and God's moving and all of that and God's leading and now putting feet to it. Now, put, now putting the responsibility where it lies and finding out a strategy and, and so far leading, obviously being led of God's sovereignty of His Holy Spirit, but now trying to get in line with God and say, God, okay, what are the steps to take? What are some helps to be done? And by the way, every church plan is different. I have three boys, they're all three different, and every birth of a church is going to be a little bit different. Now, we do know this, that in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, we find that everything that God created, He told it to reproduce. Every living organism. Cows reproduce cows. We're thankful for that, amen. Uh, buffalo reproduce buffalo. We have a buffalo farmer near us in Tennessee, and we get half a buffalo every year. Oh, it's good too. I'm telling you, it is good. Lean and mean. That's that steak. Mm, good stuff. And, uh, and I'm, I'm glad for that. Uh, cats reproduce cats for some reason. We, when we moved to Tennessee, I grew up with cats. And I, and, uh, but uh, when we moved to Tennessee, we say we got to get an outside cat. And we got two for one and, uh, and uh, two female. And we left to go on a six or seven month trip. And when we came back, we didn't have two cats. We had 13 cats. Each of those cats had had a litter. 
And I thought, you know what? I missed the, the cheap roving box on wheels that comes around that, that takes care of this issue, and I'm not going to miss it again. And so, I, and so our cats will not have other kittens anymore. Uh, but you know what? Cats reproduce cats. Bunnies reproduce bunnies. And, and mosquitoes reproduce mosquitoes, unfortunately. And ants reproduce everything that God created. He gave it, watch, not only the responsibility, but the ability to reproduce. Amen. The church is no different. The church is a living, breathing organism. Christ is the head, the church is the body. We see that all through the New Testament. And then God gives the great commission, go ye therefore and teach all nations. We're going to look at that in just a moment. But again, now when I listen to this. God gave the responsibility, the authority, and the privilege to reproduce baby churches. Colleges do not reproduce churches. Schools do not do that. Mission boards do not do that. And why, listen, Men do not do that. It is the responsibility and the privilege and the church has the authority to reproduce itself. In the Old Testament, we find that things reproduced after their kind. You're not going to have two chickens have a kitty, right? You're going to have chickens. And churches reproduce churches after their kind. That's why it's important that if you have someone like Brother Pete going out from your church, you have to know him first. Right. You, you have to know that he is going to reproduce not exactly what this church is, but it's going to have the DNA of this church. Right. It's going to be a Bible-believing, independent Baptist church, and so, and so on. It's got the DNA of this church. His constitution that he writes up and adopts for his church is probably going to be very similar to this constitution here. In fact, a lot of church planners just copy their uh, reproducing churches, Constitution. I remember we copied it and we forgot to change the church name in a couple places. That was a lot of fun after we adopted it and voted on it and all that. But it's the same thing with churches. Churches reproduce after their kind. Boy, that puts a lot of responsibility then on the church. So in this passage, in Acts chapter 17, we're going to come back to this in just a moment. In Acts chapter 17, let me make sure... My uh, clicker is working here. Yeah, the early church impacted the world. Here's a great verse in verse number 6 of Acts chapter 17. The Bible says, And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. This passage is a tremendous passage because we see the local church reproducing local churches that we're reproducing more local churches so that by the time you get to Acts chapter 19, all of Asia heard of the Lord Jesus Christ. How did they do that without internet? How did they do that without cars or planes or even pen and paper? How did they do this? When I say pen and paper, I mean as, as easy it is for us to write something. They didn't have that back then. Of course, they had papyrus and so on, but that would fade and, and tear up and so on. How did they do that without radio? How did they do that without TV? How did they do that without all of the conveniences that we have today? The early church impacted areas, and the Bible says they've turned the world upside down. What does that mean? They impacted cities to the point where the cities took note that there was Christ in their city. They took note that someone, some group of people, they were putting Christ into their communities. And the Bible says, you can read this passage later, but they, uh, they were accused of teaching things that were contrary to what that, those cities were teaching. By the way, if that's going to happen when Brother Pete goes to Dayton, Ohio, and he starts teaching and preaching Christ and so on, uh, things are going to be contrary to what's being taught in the school system there. It's going to be contrary to what's being taught in their communities there. It's being contrary to what's on the news. It's going to be contrary to what's being voted on in their councils and so on. And it's going to rub them wrong. It's going to irritate their community. Now, that's not the goal, right? The goal isn't to go in and be contentious and stir up strife and all of that. But just preaching and teaching this word will do that. 
The Bible also says that they gave the clear gospel. In fact, if you want to go back, uh, look if you look in verse number three, it says they were opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. They were going into these cities and they weren't going in with some campaign or some manufactured Christianity. They were going in with the pure, holy, simple word of God. They were going in with the simple message of Christ that he died, he was buried, and that he rose again. Boy, if you want to see a place turned upside down, you go in and say that Jesus is the only way. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. There's only one mediator between God and man. That is the man Christ Jesus. I don't don't golf a lot. I like to golf, but it doesn't like me. I like to golf. I go when it's free and when it's fun. If neither one of those are there, I'm out. But my son, my middle son, he uh, he had turned uh, 18 last year, and I told him one of the things I'll do, he wanted to go golf. I said, okay, I'll go nine holes of you with golf. And so we did that. It took me about four months to come through with that commitment, by the way. But I finally did. And we came went out in some hot uh, morning and, and uh, neither one of us had clubs. Neither, neither one of us had balls. Neither, we didn't have tees, didn't have golf shoes, nothing. Uh, and uh, so we showed up, we had to rent the clubs and everything else. And I had, uh, uh, you know, I'd figured out how to tee off and so on. And we had a lot of fun with it, but we actually caught up to the people in front of us. They were worse than we are. I don't know how that happened. We caught up to this couple, and, and this couple was as nice as could be. I mean, talking about, you know, their area and what brought them there. And they grew up in Florida, too, and moved to Tennessee and everything. And uh, then he asked me, what do you do for a living? Amen. I said, oh, I said, I'm an ecclesiastical obstetrician. He said, what in the world is that? I said, I deliver church babies. He said, I've never met someone like that. I said, you probably never will either. And so, but we, that started a whole conversation. He said, well, uh, well what kind of uh, church is it? I said, it's an independent Baptist church. And you could tell uh, he just, you know, started to get a little bit edgy. And, and this, this guy who was so pleasant, who was so easy going and helping us swing and giving us pointers and all of this. Uh, as soon as I mentioned Christ Jesus, as soon as I mentioned salvation, and I'm a very passive guy. I, I don't have a whole lot of enemies. But as soon as I mentioned that, boy, he just went off. He's like, I don't understand why everybody has to be saved. He said, you're born without salvation and all this. And his wife just kind of calmed him down and all that. And boy, it was very uneasy the rest of the, that golf game very uneasy we just it what I'm saying is this if when brother Pete goes in a, a place like Dayton and starts preaching Christ and Christ's death his burial his resurrection and so on and by the way if you were to and I were to do that more in our areas no matter if it's the Bible Belt or not boy I tell you what it's been a long time since most of the people in this community have heard a good clear gospel presentation People will start becoming an earth. Why? Because it's the gospel that turns a, a, a world upside down. It's the, it's the gospel that gets right to the heart of the individual, that reveals to them that they're a sinner, that they need to be saved. And so the gospel needs to be presented everywhere. But how did the early church get to a point to where within 25 years, and you can go back in history and look at this, within 25 years, they had reached all of the known world. By the way, have we done that today? Are we reaching all of the known world today? Not at all. Not at all. There's over 7,000, just over 7,000 different languages and dialects of languages in the world. Do you know how many many of those 7,000 have the Word of God? I mean, we're just talking about having the Word of God. 471. Just over 2,300 have the New Testament. Just over 4,000 have some verse or a tract. But only 471 have the Word of God. You know, it's a shame when you have more people in the world, I mentioned this this morning, have drunk a Coca-Cola than have ever heard the gospel presentation. 
We helped a church start in Starkville, Mississippi uh, four years ago, right across, straight from, uh, right across the street from Mississippi University. They, were meeting a, they met in a comfort inn. They were reaching people and so on. The pastor there, uh, Pastor John Harvey, told me of a, a friend that he went to school with, and that friend is now working for Coca-Cola in Atlanta. He's one of the uh, per- people who do some of their advertising and so on. He said, you'll never guess what they're working on in Coca-Cola. I said, I said what? I mean, Coca-Cola is everywhere. You can go to any third world country, there's Coca-Cola there, you know, right? I mean, everybody's on Coke. He said, they're working on a sign that is seven miles wide and three miles high. I I said, what? I said, a a Coca-Cola sign that is seven miles wide and three miles high. I said, what in the world? Why would, and he said, it probably will never be developed. He said, because of international laws. He said, but they want to take this sign piece by piece and put this sign on the moon. They want you to see on any clear night with a clear moon, Coca-Cola. Now listen, folks, they just about reached everybody in this world with their product. Now they're going out of this world to reach people with their product. They want every green Martian going by to have Coca-Cola in their hand. They want the whole universe to be addicted to their product. I remember when Coca-Cola went to New Coke back in the 1980s. My grandfather almost had a cow. He bought up every Coca-Cola he could find, put it in his cellar, and there's still some in his cellar to this day. All that and Mountain Dew. What am I saying? Coca-Cola has done in less than 100 years what we haven't done in 2000. They've got their product in the hands just about every person in this world. And if it's not in their hands, they got a billboard in their community. Some sign, some place so they can get one. But we don't have a house in every community. Or a church in every community. I believe with all my heart that the local church is local, right? Every person in this world ought to have a place to go to, to go worship the Lord, Jesus Christ, who's been buried, risen, and coming again. Amen? And have a word of God to, to, to read and, and to grow and to, and to go out and reproduce more churches and so on. The early church did this. The early church did it within 25 years. The early church had a, had a compassion. They had a, had a drive. They had commitment and so on. But I want to share with you just very quickly uh, in the New Testament four different principles that the early church had that we can adopt And then I'm going to show you in American history how that we had an early church planting revival. And then I want to leave tonight, I want to leave you with the hope of if we got serious with planting churches again, how this nation could easily, when I say that, I mean that, could easily, we could turn this nation and the world upside down within 25 years again. So let's go back now to Matthew chapter 28. I'm going to have most of these verses on the overhead as well. Matthew 28. I want you to see this. This is the Great Commission. We're going to go right into the book of Acts after this. But in Matthew chapter 28, we have these words that Lord Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you all, even to the end of the earth. I want you to see a couple of things with this, though. He said, go ye therefore and teach all nations. And so it's, it's explicit here. It is imperative that all nations, each community, has a church to go to. And by the way, uh, here in America, there are several corporations who do this, and they do, that, they do it well. Walgreens is one of them. Walmart and Walgreens have two different philosophies. Walmart says build it big and put it every seven miles within a very populated area and people will come. Walgreens says no, put one in every community and people will come. So they have smaller stores. Obviously they don't offer everything that Walmart does, but yet who has the most foot traffic? Walgreens. In the little city that I started at in, in Northport, Florida, a church plant there, 
It took a long time for Walmart to come, but by the time Walmart got there, we had already had four Walgreens in our town. And boy, I tell you what, it was getting a lot of business. They just bought out Rite Aid and and they're exploding with growth. Why? Because they're targeting local communities. Jesus had this in mind. Jesus said, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Why? To make sure they have a local area to go to. Now, their local areas may not be as close as our local areas today because we do have cars and vehicles and so on. Uh, It doesn't mean you have to have one every two miles. You can have one. uh, uh, Statistically, you begin to saturate an area when you have a church for every 10,000 people. That's when you begin to saturate an area. I live just north of Nashville now. That's kind of a headquarters of our ministry. And we're looking at Nashville. I get all the pastors there together. I say, listen, Nashville is growing 85 people a day. 85 a day. How can we target? How can we develop a strategy to hit downtown Nashville and put a, put a local church for everyone in that area to be able to come? So listen to this. It would be wonderful to see 10 churches planted at the same time saturating all of Nashville and then say, hey, listen, within walking distance, here's a church you can go to. We've helped two churches start in the same city at the same time before, but what about 10? Listen, with over 800,000 people living in the, in the Nashville city area, it needs a whole lot more than 10, but it's a great start. Here in the Great Commission, he says, teach all nations, then you baptize them, then you teach them, and so on. By the way, the point of bringing this passage up is the fact that every area needs a local church, but also that word baptizing. Baptism takes place in the local church. That's why you have a baptistry here. It takes place in the, in the community or in the, in the local body of believers. It's, an or, it's, a, it's, a, it's ordained and it's given to the local church along with the Lord's Supper to be done within the body of believers. So it's not just enough to go to Dayton, Ohio and to put gospel tracts on every door and, uh, and so on and then come back and say, hey, we reached that city. Because where do those people get baptized? Obviously, it is going there to evangelize it for the purpose of planting a local church. There was an evangelist friend of mine. He said, Brother Roland, you got to go to Ghana, Africa with me every year. And I said, well, why? And he said, because when we go there, we put up a big tent. Thousands of people come. Hundreds of people get saved every year. And I said, that sounds great. I said, where are they baptized? He said, well, we hope that a church will develop out of that. God's sovereignty. I hope a church develops. We're praying for a church to develop. Okay, our responsibility. I said, why don't we go to Ghana, Africa, set up a big tent, thousands of people get saved, or a thousand people come, hundreds of people get saved for the purpose of starting a local church. You see, that's our responsibility now, matching up with God's sovereignty. And that's what Jesus had in mind here. Go and evangelize new areas, but do it with a purpose of when, those, when there's a little body of believers starting to spring up, make sure that they have a place where they can be baptized and discipled and grow in the Lord. Amen. That's the local church. Amen. So let's go to Acts 1.8. Acts 1.8. He tells them where to go to. The Lord Jesus said, Ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So Judea was about 30 miles away from Jerusalem. Uh, Samaria was a cross-cultural area. If you remember right, Jesus said at one point, I must needs go through Samaria. And then there's the uttermost part of the earth. The word both there means all at the same time. And so as the church looks to reproduce itself, it's not just, you know, we're sending missionaries out to do what we can't do, you know. It's also, no, we're going to start reproducing churches in areas where we can and all at the same time. Let's go to Acts then in Acts chapter 2 and see how they did. The early church, the day of Pentecost happened. Peter gets up and preaches. And the Bible says about 3,000 souls were added to that church. It later says in Acts chapter 4, verse 4, many believed 
about 5,000. And so this early church was growing in the book of Acts. Uh, this early church at Jerusalem, they saw people saved, saw people baptized, added to the church. Uh, they were doing everything that Jesus said to do, except we do not see any note, any word of Judea, Samaria, or the uttermost. Isn't that where Christ told them to go? Yes, but we don't see that. We see Jerusalem growing. It was a large church. It was a mega church, probably a giga church. It's a big church, but no mention of Judea or Samaria or the uttermost until we get to Acts chapter 8. So turn with me there to Acts chapter 8. It's almost like God wrote the Bible. You'll see this. God did write it, right? By the way, this is a presentation but I'll be preaching at times, so I call it a presentation. all right? So I'm trying to do both. Acts chapter 8, And Saul was consenting unto his death, verse 1, that is the death of Stephen, the first martyr. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So God did, through persecution, what the early church did not voluntarily do. They did not have compassion with commitment on the Judeas, Samarias, and the uttermost. There was a lot happening at the church at Jerusalem. Thousands of people were now attending. People were getting saved and lives changed. And by the way, when you're going to a church and everything is going on there, boy, it, you don't want to leave. You want to see God work. You want to see God. But watch this. God's plan wasn't for one church. God's plan was for churches. Amen. So God allowed persecution. And the Bible is very explicit. It says, they which were scattered abroad throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. The early church under persecution began to scatter. They be going to go, they went to other regions, other cities. And the Bible says that they preached Christ. Look at if you would in verse number four. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. And so you see that these early Christians under persecution scattered, but they didn't hide. No, they let their light shine. They preached the word. They shared that Christ died, was buried, and rose again. They talked about Christ Jesus. They spread the gospel. They spread the word of God. The things that they had learned and memorized and so on there at the Church of Jerusalem, now they're sharing with new believers. And there's little uh, nucleuses now of churches now springing up. Most of them needed pastors. They needed leadership. But there was groups of them. You can go through, I won't, but you can go through chapters 8 and 9 and circle everywhere Christians begin to spring up. Little nucleuses of churches springing up. By the way, you don't need, now I say this cautiously, you don't need a building to start a church. Now, in this day and time, I don't advise starting in a house. There was a day and time which you could, but this day and time, people are very hesitant to, uh, to go into someone else's home. They just are, especially someone they don't know. And so, but what I am saying is this, um, in the early days, their focus wasn't, well, if we get a building, then we'll start a church there. Wow. No, their focus was on that area needs Christ. Yeah. And, and by the way, we, we've helped 168 churches starting, 120 some in the States, uh, 48 uh, outside of the United States. Um, we've helped these churches start. 92% of those churches survived and are taking on missionaries and reproducing more churches and so on. Uh, and, and it's a wonderful thing to see. But watch this. Every time we have never started a church outside, God has always provided a meeting place. But the meeting place didn't come first. The compassion for that community and the commitment to go there and the obedience to go there came first. And then God provided in, in marvelous ways, miraculous ways. God has provided great meeting places. All I'm saying is this, 
Wherever God leads, God provides. And so these young Christians, as they went out and they spread the gospel, these new churches are springing up. And then we get to Acts chapter 9, verse 31, my favorite verse in all the book of Acts. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. The Bible says, then had the churches. That's the first time the word church is used in its plural form in the Bible. That's God's plan. Then had the churches rest throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. There are three words here that I want you to see here, and that is the word churches. Like I said, that is God's plan. By the way, I'm going back to Nashville, Tennessee for a minute, literally tomorrow morning, but just for a minute tonight with all the growth that's there and by the way you have cities growing faster than Nashville is you have Charlotte growing you have uh, Richmond here growing you probably Winston-Salem is growing quickly you have people moving in we call them halfback I pastored in Florida where all the people from up north and New England and in Ohio and in Michigan they moved down right and then I said this morning it got too hot down there and they didn't like Florida because it's hot and so they wanted to move back up north. But you know what? They didn't move, they didn't move all where all the snow is. No, they moved half of the way back. And that's where all these people are coming from. You can thank the humidity and mosquitoes of South Florida. So places like Richmond and Nashville and Knoxville and Charlotte and all these areas around you, they're growing by half back people. Ask them where they're from. So when the, they want the four seasons. They don't want the snow all the time. They don't want the heat all the time. But we can look at Nashville for a moment and say, you know what? Why don't we just plant one church in Nashville? One church that hopefully will run about a thousand people and maybe that'll make an impact. Okay, that could be fine, but watch this. What if that one church dies? How many churches you have left? None. If it only has one, right? Running a thousand. But instead of doing that, what if you planted 10 churches that ran a hundred people and one dies? You still have nine, right? And what if those 10 that were started had a plan that within five years or 10 years, they're going to reproduce another church? You may have some fatalities, but I'll tell you what, you're way better off in the long run because now you've got 16 churches, 20 churches, 30 churches. You've got churches reproducing churches and so on. That's God's plan, churches. Churches. And then look at the Bible says, the last word of that verse is multiplied. Multiplied. Now, we're not talking about addition. We're talking about multiplication here. You can easily fill up a church building. On Super Bowl Sunday, you could have a big screen up here. You could tell everybody in town, you're going to have a big cookout. You're going to give free T-bone steak for everybody for the Super Bowl. You could have some big concert, whatever, 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 and you could absolutely pack this building out. People would be waiting outside for their T-bone steak. But is that what's God's plan? No, God's plan has always been multiplication. Multiplying Christ in people. Multiplying character, biblical principles and character into people. Now, if I had 10 kids, which I don't, you would never come up to me. If I had 10 kids, I've got three, but you would never come up to me if I had 10 kids and say, hey, you have been successful. You might say other things like, you know, what kind of vehicle do you drive? You know, or you might say, oh, where do you get all those clothes or whatever? What's your budget for food? You know, you might say other things, but you'd never come up and say, hey, you've been successful. When do we say you're successful? It's when you have multiplied Christ into your kids. That's good. Amen. There's no perfect kids. I got three of them, and I know they're not perfect, okay? But if they have a tender heart for the Lord, that's good. okay? Amen. That's what we want to see. Amen. They genuinely have a heart to serve the Lord. Amen. Now watch, watch. Why is it then when we look at churches and we say, oh, that church runs over a thousand people, they must be successful it's not the number 
It's what's being multiplied within that church. Disciples of Christ. When I first started a church in South Florida, down, I would go to preachers fellowships and they'd always ask me, how many are you running? How many are you running? And I, I got to the, you know, if I was running 50 one week, I, I wanted to go to the, uh, the meeting. But if I only had 15, I didn't want to go. Because yeah. I knew what they're going to say. I wanted to get a button that says, don't ask. <laughs> I don't think biblically the early churches got together and said, how many are you running? I think they probably, if they did get together as often as we do, they probably had the question of, where are you running? I'm telling you, Brother Pete, you've probably been in a number of, of meetings already with pastors and so on. I, I'm, I'm there all the time, and I, uh, and, and I love you know, being around preachers and so on. But I have yet to go to a preacher's meeting with their, where the whole meeting is all about where they're running and how we can help each other to, to effectively reach those areas and so on. Man, I'm telling you what, that's going to turn the world upside down. The emphasis isn't on how many, it's on where. And as they multiplied, they saw Christ in their people. And then the middle, middle of the verse there, the Bible says they were edified. They were edified. They built each other up. Now listen, in the history of our churches, in the history of our churches, in the, 60s and, in the late 60s and early 70s, something happened. In the 50s and 60s, we were planting for every four churches in existence in America, six churches were being planted. By the time the 80s came around, we were only planting one church for every four in existence. We were planting six for every four, and within 20 years, we were only planting one for every four. Something happened. And the something that happened was this. It boils down to this. Churches started competing Instead of cooperating. Churches started building kingdoms instead of building God's kingdom. People, churches started putting more emphasis on putting people in a building and less emphasis on building people. And because of that and other areas... The prosperity of America didn't help either during that time. The emphasis then became on how big is the church, how big is the bus ministry, how many were baptized, how many were saved, and many, many, many. And the whole, the whole dynamic changed from cooperating to plant more churches and give, put more missionaries on the field to now how big is everything. And that almost killed church planting, and we have been reaping it ever since. We wonder why our America is the way it is. America is darker now because it has lost thousands of lights. Fourteen churches die a day in America. Over 4,500 a year. And we simply are not replacing those churches. And here the Bible says they edify, they build each other up. It wasn't how many, it was where they were multiplying Christ, they were Focusing on churches and churches alone, not just a church. So here are the four principles very quickly. Whoops, let me go through this very quick. I've got to put this in here. In 1900, I told you this morning, there was one church for every 500. In 2000, there was one church for every 50,000 now in America. And if this rate continues in about 87 more years, or 80, uh, 83, 84 82, <laughs> I don't know what year I'm in. More years, we will see one church for every five million. By the way, that ratio, that last statistic there, is very much Europe today. You'd be hard-pressed to find a good, solid church if you were to go to Europe today. One per five million is the ratio. The early church reached the world, and they did it these simple steps I'm going to be very quick with these. Number one, they were ordinary Christians that had purpose and passion. I think we've just about exhausted that today. They had compassion on the lost, and they had a purpose. Yes, they were praying for revival, but they knew that they had a personal responsibility to serve the Lord and target areas. So they, 
They had a purpose and passion. Number two, they were sensitive to the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 13, the Holy Spirit said to the church at Antioch, the Holy Spirit moved in that service. They were sensitive to God's leading. They didn't just look at a city and say, let's, let's try to uh, orchestrate something here. No, no. They got direct orders from the Holy Spirit of God. They were led of the Spirit of God. Number three, and this is very important, they multiplied leadership within their churches. They weren't just focusing, like I said, on putting people in a building. They were focusing on building people That's in Christ. Amen. And it's important to note that wherever Paul went under the authority of the Antioch church, wherever Paul went, he appointed leadership. Amen. He told Titus to ordain elders in every city of Crete. Right. What does that mean? Well, that's a good indication that the church at Antioch had the authority and the purpose and the responsibility to plant more churches. And they took that seriously. When they sent Paul out, Paul went into areas, and yes, he evangelized the areas, but he didn't leave there till there was a nucleus built up, and he, under the authority of the Antioch church, appointed the pastor. He didn't leave it up to just the nucleus of people to kind of vote in something or whatever. No, no. The, he, the authority lies in the local church to reproduce after its kind. And then number four, how they reached the world within 25 years? They committed to spreading the gospel that all they in Asia heard. In other words, they were committed until it was done. And even then, the population kept growing. They, none of these people lived to see it completely done. But they could say after a certain period of time, you know what? We have saturated areas now. We have to keep it going. I would love to see a different problem than what we're seeing today. I would love to see a problem of how to keep churches reproducing instead of now how to motivate churches to reproduce. I would rather be at the tail end of this saying, you know what? We've targeted about every major area. Now we have to go back and strengthen those churches and keep them going and making sure. Boy, I'm telling you, we're losing on both sides right now. We're not, we're not planting enough churches and we're also losing numbers of churches. So they were committed. Now watch this. The early church did this within 25 years. Now keep that in mind as we progress here. Let's, how they, let's look at the early church and how the early church in America impacted America. I told you this morning, I'm going to share with you where the Bible Belt came from. There was a great awakening period. Anybody remember that? Been around that long? No, I don't think anybody was. In the 1700s? Great Awakening up in New England. Really three preachers God used, William Tennant, Jonathan Edwards, and George Whitfield to preach and, and the Holy Bible. They concentrated, and this is important, they concentrated on holy living. And it was a great time to see. I mean, people turned to the Lord. They, they realized they were sinners. They needed to be saved and so on. They concentrated on holy living. Now watch this. But little concentration was given to church planting. There was a man, his name was Schubel Stearns. I get a lot of this from two different sources, Mark Irmler and James Beller. James Beller is with the Lord now. But in his book, uh, America's Greatest Revival, he talks about a man named Schubel Stearns and and there's a lot of uh, talk of this man. But he was a man that came from the Great Awakening. In fact, <laughs> he and his family got run out of New England because mainly he believed in water immersion for baptism. And back in that day, you died for that. But he came out of uh, New England. He settled in Virginia and then eventually in North Carolina. And he believed in three things. He believed in fervent soul winning. He believed in giving the gospel to everyone, every chance. Wonderful, huh? He believed in water baptism. Under the water and up out of the water, just as the Bible explains. But he also believed in a, in a fervent reproducing of churches. He started with one. 
And there it is. You can see the elaborate air conditioning. You have all the windows and doors open. Uh, I don't think there was any purposeful indoor plumbing. Um, it had, this building is still stands in Sandy Creek. It, it's been redone twice. <laughs> but it wasn't anything big, and he didn't really have an ambition to have a large mega church. His ambition was to build a work and then train, 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 and sin, sin, sin. And Schubert Scherns started with a congregation of 16, mainly his family, in 1755. He had a burden to reach other communities with the church, and he, and he would have his members go with him to reach those communities. And this is what he did. He had this list called a sitter's list. Everybody wants to sign up on that one, amen? I don't even know why it was called a sitter's list, because you didn't sit. When you signed up, you signed up and you committed to three different areas. The first thing you would do is you're going to go with your pastor on a Sunday afternoon in between the morning service and, and maybe an evening uh, uh, Bible study or service they had. You're, in the afternoon, you're going to travel with your pastor over to a nearby Judea or Samaria, and you are going to hold a service with your pastor. The second thing you committed to when you signed up was that when you get to that area, you're going to go into that area and you're going to find a family or a person to bring with you to that service. What a great idea. The third thing that you signed up to, and I believe this is where it all began for Independent Baptist, is you signed up and you committed to bringing food with you. You're going to bring the fried chicken and the banana pudding and sweet tea. My kids always rate areas when we travel of whether or not they have sweet tea. If they have sweet tea, we're close to heaven. But when you traveled with that food, you did it with a purpose. The purpose was this, where they would go to an area, hold a service, preach the gospel, preach the word of God. After that, they would eat with the guests who came. And during that time, the people that traveled over with Schubelsterns were trained to be able to disciple those people right there at the dinner table. What a tremendous idea. And it worked. Schubel Stearns was an evangelist by nature. He was a pastor. He was a mentor. He was a motivating pastor. But he believed in fervent church planting. And so he was constant training, constantly sending. So when that new church would get up and going, there was a nucleus there. He would have someone trained to take that church and be, he would appoint the leadership and so on. Then he would go in another direction with his sitters list with people signed up and start targeting another area the whole, now watch this, from day one, that new nucleus of believers would on Sunday afternoons travel to the next city and hold services. As a new baby church. My grandmother was the first one who told me, she's 93 now, my grandmother said, Jeremy, if you, ever, if you wait till you're financially able to have kids, you never will. And if a church plant waits so they're financially able to, re, to birth itself again, they never will. It's not the finances. Remember, God's sovereign. He's looking for us to commit to personal responsibility. And God would provide. So he did this over and over and over and over and over. Now listen, he was in North Carolina. You go too far to the east and you're going to be doing some aqua church planting, right? So which way to go? He went west. By the way, the westward expansion of America during that time was the great pioneering days. People were heading west. Going west, my son, go west. And they jumped on that bandwagon. They kept planting churches. Now watch this. Within 15 years, 42 churches were started. 50 more years, 735 churches were started. And long after Schubel Stearns died, in the next 75 years, we can attribute, and this has come from Mark Ermler and, and other historians, over 7,200 new churches were started this way. 
All because a church and a people got a burden to saturate areas and to put Christ into communities. One church plant at a time. Now I'm going to show you this map. This is where those churches were planted. And this right now, what do we call this now? This area, and it's red and, and orange here. What do we call this? This is the Bible Belt. This is where the Bible Belt came from. Because it wasn't just Hubel Stearns. Other churches caught on to this as well. It wasn't just, you know, him after a while. It was churches. There's a, there was the second great awakening that happened uh, up just 20 miles north of where I live in the southern uh, Kentucky border uh, that uh, was an offspring of the church planting revival. And by the way, the great awakening that America had did not survive to have a long-lasting effect on America. In fact, right now, one of the coldest spiritual places to plant churches is up in, in New England. But that was where the great awakening happened. But because they did not concentrate on church planting, leaving churches behind that were saturating areas now we have to retarget and refocus and re-evangelize and replant New England. The revival and church planting of Shubal Stearns helped from the, uh, more, form the moral culture of America and lasted more than 250 years. Even to this day, we still call it the Bible Belt. I, I, I know the, the belt is coming undone. I believe that. It is. But we still to this day, any politician that comes in the South knows they've got to be more conservative in what they say. We're seeing that come undone. I realize that. The question, the question then is, what will North America and the world become if independent Baptists do not begin another revival of church planting? What will become of our nation? Now let me leave you with this. Here's the hope then, okay? The church today needs to get back to reproducing churches to reach the world, just as you're doing with Brother Pete. There are roughly 11,000 independent Baptist churches in America now, some say there's more, some say less. I just took the middle number and say about 11,000. We're not sure because they're independent Baptists. There's no roll call anywhere. There, there are roughly about 33,000 incorporated cities and townships in the United States. And if every independent Baptist would simply target one of those places... Twice in 10 years, by the way, that's one every five years, which is very, very possible. Really, for any church of any size, it's possible. Within 10 years, and targeted a needy city or township, every town or city in America would have a very biblical, evangelistic, Bible-believing, independent Baptist church. Wow, that's, that's something. Within 10 years, it could be done. If this went on for 25 years, once every five years, for 25 years, uh, America again would be saturated within 25 years, would be absolutely saturated with Bible-believing, Bible-preaching, evangelistic churches. Now watch, it doesn't stop there. Missions would greatly be affected then. More laborers would be called to go, more finances would be given. Uh, the, the churches that we have helped over the last 25 years, this August will be 25 years, the churches that we have helped, we do their missions conference a lot and so on if they want us to. We don't, uh, we don't tell them they have to support our ministry. Many of them do, but uh, we're not a mission board. We don't take their money, but we try to keep up on what they give to missions. And this year, they give over $4 million to missions every year. So uh, the finances would be given. More laborers, the more churches you have, the more people are called to the mission field and so on. And I believe the world would be reached. If I didn't think the world could have a local church in every area, I wouldn't be up here tonight. I'd be doing something else. Because then, because I, then, then I would say, if I didn't think the whole world could be or could have a local church in their area, then, then the Bible is flawed then God doesn't really mean what he says. When he's not willing that any should perish. He's not, he doesn't mean it. But he does, right? And so that's why we're here. So the question is this. Not how many are we running, but where are you running? Amen. Boy, it's a privilege to be a part of what God is doing here. 
running, if you want to say that, to Dayton, Ohio. So that's a good distance away. It's going to require a lot of effort and so on. Yeah, God's sovereignty is already leading, right? Now comes the personal responsibility to say, God, where do you want me to get involved with all of this? And let me just share this with you, and I'll be finished. It is a thrill. The churches and the people that get behind reproducing their church in another community, it's like having a baby. It's a lot of fun. It's exciting. You don't know how big the baby's going to be. You don't know what kind of characteristics, eye color and hair and all that's going to have. When that baby is birthed and it cries, you just hand it over to Pete. But you know, it is a thrill. And the churches that have done this have said, you know what? That's the first one. Let's, do, let's have another baby. And the churches that help out, they go back and they say, you know what, let's have a baby. We help churches now that are, have seven, eight, nine babies. We have, we have churches now that we help who have grandbaby churches. And those churches, God has blessed with a, a spirit of, of revival in their churches and a, and a growth in their churches. And boy, there's nothing like it. Why? Because church is not about the programs. It's about the possibilities in reaching communities by putting Christ in those communities. And when a church gets behind someone like Pete and starts praying for him and starts getting involved, boy, there's just, it, it is, that's, that is God's plan. And it's a thrill to be a part of it. Father, we thank you for the time we've had tonight and we thank you for not only the history, but your word is so plain, so simple. But then we think about the possibilities. And dear Father, I pray that you would help us to surrender to whatever you would have us to do as we commit to helping reproduce this first church in Dayton, Ohio. Have your will and your way, we pray. As the pastor, I want to thank you for viewing our video today. However, if God's dealt with your heart, we do not want to end this video without giving you a chance to be able to accept Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. If you're there today and God's actually dealing with your heart, I want to remind you what the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means every single one of us has had problems, issues, sin, failures, faults in our past. The great thing is this, is that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man coming through the Father but by me. There is a way to be able to have hope, to have eternal security within the Lord Jesus Christ, to be able to know that you're saved by the grace of God. Now the great thing about the Bible is it tells us about the love of God. He says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's amazing to a lot of people, and they can quote it. But the beauty of it is this, is the very next verse tells us the purpose of Christ. Because the Bible says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, that the world through Him might be saved. That means that God sent His Son to die for those of us who are sinners so that we can have fellowship with God Himself. Now, if you're there today and God's really been dealing with your heart, I want to ask you this question. Do you really believe that God's been dealing with you about salvation? If that's the case today, then I want to tell you what you need to do is repent of your sins. You need to die to yourself. Admit that you are lost and you're on your way to hell. And then look at what the Bible tells us, that He tells us that we can be saved through Christ. Who do you call on? There's only one. Because the Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's only through Christ and Christ alone. So I tell you today, would you trust in Christ? I want to ask you would, you, would you trust in Him as a personal Savior? You say, Brother Jason, I don't really know if I can do that. Well, let me tell you, the Bible also tells us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It don't matter who you are, where you come from, God sent His Son to die for everyone. If you've made this decision today to be able to trust in Christ, to be able to die to yourself, to, to be able to start living for Christ and accept Him as a personal Savior after repenting, would you do us a favor and be able to contact us at 336-788-0551 and let us know about this decision that you made so we can start praying for you. Thank you so much.